Just ahead on American Black Journal, we're going to dedicate the entire show to an important conversation on hate crimes and civil rights following the tragedy in South Carolina. Our guests will talk about a number of issues tied to the incident, including church security, gun laws, and the Confederate flag. Stay right there. American Black Journal is next. At DTE Energy, we believe that we have a greater responsibility. We believe that being part of a community means being involved in the fabric of that community, investing time, effort, and resources in the communities we serve. DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of American Black Journal. Welcome to American Black Journal, I'm Stephen Henderson. As the nation continues to grapple with the fatal shootings of nine black people inside a South Carolina church, the tragedy will forever be part of civil rights history. By all appearances, it was a hate crime targeting African Americans in the historic city of Charleston. The suspect, Dylan Roof, is a 21-year-old white man who reportedly shouted racist comments after sitting with the churchgoers for an hour during their Bible study session. Later, Roof told police he wanted to start a race war. A website registered in his name contained a hate-filled manifesto and photos of Roof holding a Confederate flag. Meanwhile, South Carolina's governor has called for lawmakers to remove the Confederate flag from the Capitol grounds, but others argue the major issue is access to guns and not the Confederate flag. Today we're talking in depth about the impact of this horrific attack. I'm pleased to have as my guests the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of Michigan, Barbara McQuaid, Reverend Horace Sheffield III of New Destiny Christian Fellowship Church, and Augustine Arblu, who's from the Michigan Civil Rights Commission. Welcome to American Black Journal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Reverend, I want to start with you because this happened in a church. Mm -hmm. uh, churches are, are supposed to be places uh, that we are safe uh, from, from the outside world and all the awful things. Unfortunately for African Americans, uh, our history hasn't borne that out. Uh, churches have been places where we've organized uh, labor movements, civil rights movements, and therefore have always been targets of folks who uh, wanted to forestall our, our future and, and uh, you know, really exacerbate any efforts to organize. You know, one of the things that I think is most amazing, and I, I, you know, from a spiritual standpoint, because there's always some good that can come out of bad, had uh, those uh, families reacted differently. I don't think we even be talking about the removal of the Confederate flag. Is that right? I think that the way that they handled that touched so many people's hearts. I literally cried. Yeah. Uh, yeah. To see such real love and the ethos, you know, Christ died. Right. And through his death, uh, new life was given to many. And through the death of these people, something that people have been trying to do for years. Right. Right. Yeah, people from Detroit go out every year <laughs> trying to remove that flag. Right. Right. And they did it on their own. Yeah. And I think had they responded differently, we wouldn't have seen that happen. Uh, as a pastor, you know, I mean, churches are open to anybody uh, to come in. Does this may give you a pause about uh, how safe that is? I've had incidents in my own church. I mean, you have to um, kind of balance the right for people to be there by the safety of the folks who you know are there for the right reason. Yeah. Many churches have far more security unfortunately in my estimation most of it is focused on the protection of the pastor as opposed to the protection of people of the congregation views. sure um, but I had a watch night service and some gentlemen across from ninth precinct came in my church and I knew what they were there for and uh, by the grace of God you know we were able to afford what what happened churches are targets uh, people yeah. come there with money to give money yeah and so there are places that uh, people know take in money every Sunday, just like stores. Right, yeah. right, and they can be targets yes. that way. Yeah, uh, Ms. McQuaid, um, this is a number of things, I think, that, that touch uh, your area. It's a hate crime, uh, it's a civil rights issue, and here we have, uh, again, this issue with guns uh, and the access to guns to, to, to be able to do this. But, but I'm curious, this sort of harkens back to the, to the uh, the work that the Justice Department had to do in the 1960s, protecting people uh, in the South during the, the racial tumult uh, of that decade. Yes, and although um, I think there are p many people who think that 
uh, those race wars are over. The Justice Department knows that that really is not, it's not true. true. And yeah. we have been working on these issues. We work on prevention with these issues uh, to this day. Um, I think a lot of the media attention on terrorism focuses on international terrorism yeah, yeah. Uh, because that's the spectacular and the big planes and things. But the Justice Department has also been focusing on domestic terrorism and hate crimes. And if you look at the actual number of incidents, the hate crimes incidents um, involving uh, Americans hurting other Americans for either a racist agenda or an anti-government agenda far outnumbers yeah. international terrorist incidents. So we need, know that we need to work on both of those issues, both from an enforcement perspective and a prevention one. And how do you, how do, you do that? What's, what's the prevention end of that look like? I mean, somebody like this 21-year-old man in South Carolina, uh, how do you know who that person is or what they intend to do? Well, there's no fail-safe and there's no 100% uh, solution. One thing, for example, we're having a, uh, hosting a meeting today for pastors um, in Detroit just to talk about ways to protect places of worship. Uh -huh. um, and and as, as, as Reverend she Sheffield talks about, you, there's a real balance there of making sure that houses of worship are open yeah. but safe. So that's one method that we want to do, just preventing the targets from being um, ha harmed. But the other is some of the techniques that FBI agents do to find um, people who uh, might be bent on hurting others. You know, in America, you can hate but you can't hurt. Right. And so trying to identify those who are just speaking out their mind and those who might do something else. Um, many times ruses are set up. If someone expresses online a desire to hurt people, uh, sometimes an informant goes in and says, tr tries to uh, elicit what their plans to are. Figure so out what they're doing. Stop before sure. they actually hurt someone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to talk about the gun issue here. Uh, that's something that we talk about here in Detroit all the time. Far too many guns in the hands of people who, who shouldn't have them. Is that is tougher enforcement of uh, uh, gun laws and response to gun crimes one of the things that might prevent this kind of thing from happening? Yeah, I don't know that if you could, you could ever prevent this kind of thing from happening. Yeah. And there's certainly other ways people hurt people with bombs and other things. But um, we are certainly uh, dedicated to enforcing the gun laws that we have to make sure they stay out of the hands of felons and those with mental illnesses yeah. to try to reduce the number of these kinds of things. And certainly, as you raise. Having a gun makes it an awful lot easier to hurt somebody. Sure. Not in this instance, but in other instances, we've seen those big capacity magazines give yes. shooters the capacity to uh, do a lot more damage than they could if they didn't have them. Right, right. Uh, Augie, as you asked me to call you, uh, uh, let's talk about Michigan versus South Carolina. Right. Uh, this happened in the South. I think a lot of people uh, have, have opinions about what the South is like because of its history. Uh, but these are the kinds of issues that we face here in Michigan Absolutely. too, right? Absolutely, we face these issues not only in Michigan but throughout the United States. We can't ignore it. The fact is that that, that racism is part of our DNA and, and that doesn't go away overnight. Uh, we have to think about the underlying causes and we have to think about some of the challenges that we're facing. Yeah. We have inequities in wealth, we have inequities in income and that creates challenges. And then we have another uh, issue. A as, as Barbara was commenting, hate crimes are in an increase. What, what's caused that? Right. And it seems to me that, that the changes that are taking place are a threat. And they're, they're a threat to, to communities, certain communities. And so, for, from some perspective, it could be the white communities, elements within the whites feel threatened by the changes there. When you talk place. about talk about the changes that you're that you're referring to there. Well, I, I see. Well, first of all, we can't ignore the fact that we have a a president that is African American. Sure. That's a, a lifetime change, and and it's something that we should all be proud that we've made some significant progress. But nevertheless, as this man, uh, President Obama, was elected, what have we seen? an increase in hate crimes. Yeah. So that means we've got to still address the underlying challenges that we face. Yeah. And what, how do you do that? I mean, what are the well, things you that know, we I've, need to... I've, I've, I've had this discourse about why there's less civility. Yeah. There's less civility because the people who we elect to be civil aren't civil. Right. Well, that's I a mean, good point. I mean, people in public positions yeah. uh, entrench themselves and are partisan. And, and I mean, for a person to disrupt the president's speech, in the wells of Congress, sure. unheard of. Whether it was because he was black, they don't agree with his mm -hmm. political point of view. You know, I tell people all the time, talk 
I'm a talk shows. We we do more damage with words than some folks do yeah, with knives. That's that's very I mean, true. we do the same thing. We yeah. assassinate characters. Uh, you know, we assault people, and then we expect people who are irrational, who don't have the cerebral, you know, right. uh, uh, ability to think through things, to act more rational than we do. Yeah. Uh, is it true that hate crimes are uh, are up since the president was elected? Um, it's difficult to measure because hate crimes are up, but reporting is never very good in the hate crimes okay. arena. Hate crimes are up, but 87% of law enforcement agencies report zero hate crimes in their communities, which I think most uh, experts uh, believe is flawed. Mm -hmm. It's just not right. Mm -hmm. But we do see that the highest percentage of hate crimes are hate crimes against African Americans. Yeah. And so this is certainly um, a, a significant threat that uh, the federal government, at least, is very focused on. Yeah, and in this case in South Carolina, if this is deemed a hate crime, what what are the enhanced penalties uh, that that Dylan Roof might might face? Because it, does it does it does it make it worse for him in court or potentially worse? It, it does. It could expose him to a higher sentence. And I also think hate crime charges in general are important because what it says is it, it requires an additional element, which makes it a little harder for the prosecution to prove. Yeah. In addition to showing that he killed people, you have to show that his motive was uh, based on race. Sure. Although there's certainly evidence here that that was the case. Um, but I think what's important about that is it sends a message to the community that this behavior is not tolerated in our society because when someone commits that kind of crime, it's just not those nine people and their families who are impacted. It's a whole community and a whole nation yeah. that gets impacted by that. So that's why it's important, I think, to consider those kinds of charges that bring within those enhanced penalties. Yeah, to make that, that point. Um, we, we see hate crimes here in Michigan. The Michigan Civil Rights Commission, I know, has been pushing for some changes, right, in the law that would that would deal with that differently. Well, we, we, we are always are interested in making changes that provide additional protections to different individuals yeah. different because of race, uh, ethnic, uh, sexual orientation. Sure. And that's one area. That's one we're about still LGBT. fighting about that we're and still talking about that. how to get to, to a space Coverage. where that's more. And, and that's a challenge and because, uh, as Horace has indicated, we have such uh, the, the, the way of bringing and discussing uh, issues seems to be polarizing. Yeah. We seem to take these very uh, uh, extreme approaches and and allows for for meaningful dialogue. Yeah, and yeah. that has to change. Yeah. Right. Uh, we're going to take a short break. Uh, we'll, when we'll come back, we're going to continue our conversation. Plus, we'll look back at an interview with one of the South Carolina victims that appeared on Detroit Public Television. That's all next, right after this look at some important moments in Detroit's black history. I'm Ken Coleman with a look back at African American life in Detroit. This week in 1990, South African freedom fighter Nelson Mandela visited Detroit during his historic eight-city tour of America. In 1998, Dr. Glenda Price was appointed president of Mary Grove College. She was the first African-American to hold the position. And in 1977, Diana Lewis delivered her first newscast at WXYZ TV7. These are significant events this week in Detroit's black history, taken from the book On This Day, African-American Life in Detroit. Today we're talking about the nine people killed at the historic Emanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina. One of the victims was the church's pastor, the Reverend Clementa Pinckney. He was also a state senator who recently appeared in the PBS documentary, The African Americans, Many Rivers to Cross. He talked about blacks and politics with host Henry Louis Gates, Jr. Why does black political participation matter so much? Why is it important? Well, it's important for many reasons. One. We're impacted by the system, you know. Uh, what's the quote? Don't hate the player, hate the game. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, know? Uh, you know, that's, I mean, that's, that's what it boils down to. We are in uh, an American system where politics and money and the power that it generates controls and impacts our life. Uh, not every aspect, but many aspects. Um, the, from the eye drops that goes into a baby's eyes to how a death certificate reads and nearly everything in the middle is impacted by the political process. So we need to be a part if we want to stay in our own life, mm -hmm. if we want to be independent, if we want to influence what's happening around us, or the reverse is to let everybody else control and influence and then we just sort of take whatever comes. That's what slaves did. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we're not slaves. 
we're Americans, so we have responsibility to look at ourselves, self-help, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, I, I also think that we have a, a historic legacy that we need to uphold, um, rather it be Robert Smalls, R.H. Kane, uh, other persons who, who were the first elected in this state. We, we, we need to be involved as they were involved. But so many unnamed persons, mm -hmm. you know, the grandmother's prayer, Lord, let me be free. If not me, my children. If not my children, my children's children. Deferred gratification. Deferred, right. deferred gratification, mm -hmm. you know. So we have an obligation. We have a legacy to uphold. The, the, the people who died so that we could have the right to vote. Mm -hmm. The people who sacrificed so that we could one day realize the, the, the dream of a black president, mm -hmm. uh, black elected officials, uh, you know, after segregation. Uh, we, have a, we have an opportunity. I think it, it does our... It does the memories of our people a disservice when we do not vote, if we do not vote, mm -hmm. and if we buy into this whole idea that other people have perpetuated of saying our vote doesn't count. Mm -hmm. We don't have that. We don't have that um, choice. You know, we don't have that. Um, we, you know, we don't have that privilege to say our vote doesn't count mm -hmm. because history tells us differently. We've been talking about the impact of the South Carolina church shootings. My guests are U.S. Attorney Barbara McQuaid, Reverend Horace Sheffield III, and Augustine Arbelew. Reverend Sheffield, many of the victims uh, talked about the forgiveness that they're ready to already offer uh, to the perpetrator here. That, that struck well, me not as not only unusual. ready, that they actually, you know, uh, they said, voiced yeah. their forgiveness. I forgive Dylan. Uh, I forgive you. I've seen a lot of, I have a lot of friends yeah. who, who, reacted very negatively to that and felt like uh, why should well, why should that you know we, we live in an okay. era where the authenticity and integrity of Christianity is challenged anyway mm -hmm. uh, people love uh, love Jesus but can't stand anybody else <laughs> and uh, here, here are people who appropriated the ethos of Christ who looked at his male factors who crucified him and said father forgive them right now that takes a whole lot of Holy Spirit sure Holy Spirit just not to help you you know uh, get through the day or win the lottery it's to help you deal with people in a loving way yeah. now they didn't say they weren't hurt they weren't mad but one thing I want to point out that, that did bother me uh -huh. it bothered me for the judge to spend as much time uh, on equal footing what the family of Dylan uh, was going I through say. I mean I don't think that was an appropriate time for that yeah at some other uh, point uh, not much of it was made, but if I'm in the courtroom and my mom and dad just got killed, and I'm forgiving, I'm less them, interested in yeah. what I'm, the perpetrator's and, and, right, family I mean, is feeling. And I know the family's going through much yeah. because often years after these things, mm -hmm. families are held accountable for the yeah. deeds of their, their right. sons and daughters. Right. I, I want to talk about the the flag, the Confederate flag, which has become. Uh, sort of the symbol of this incident, and there's been a lot of talk and focus on whether it should fly uh, on the Capitol grounds in South Carolina. Of course, lots of other states still have some form uh, or version of the flag in their Statues flag. Statues of Jefferson Davis uh, in, in the uh, Capitol. Absolutely. I lived in, I lived yeah. in Baltimore uh, for a decade. There are many, many uh, Confederate uh, monuments all over the city, even though uh, Baltimore technically wasn't even part of the, of the Confederacy. Uh, are these close. symbols? It was close. It was just over the line. It is, it um, is amazing that w with this recent massacre, this mm -hmm. killing, that Confederate flag sales have gone up. I, yeah. I noticed that somewhere it's gone up 3,000%. Yeah. Right. What does that say about our society? Well, is that, I mean, again, are these just symbols or <laughs> are, they, are they, you know, proxies for more? Well, symbols carry with issues. them. You know, the, I keep using the word ethos. I mean, it, it, it's more than just a representation. Uh, I was moved by Strong Thurman's son and uh, the impassioned plea he made. I mean, uh -huh. the reality, anyone who suggests that this doesn't conjure up. Uh, my dad wrote a poem when he was 19 years old about Claude Neal in Greenwood, Florida. Uh -huh. It's in the Detroit News, uh, who was forced to eat his penis and testicles before he was hung. Hmm. Uh, I mean, we know what this represents. Right. I'm old enough to remember segregation. My dad was in the movement, would go down there and disappear for months. Um, so to act as if this is just celebrating a way of life, what was that way of life? Right, right. right. 
yeah. you know what that what man, was right it was. about and what was the it was a tale of two worlds right, right. and the world that we lived in uh, that impinges upon a memory in such a way that we don't yeah. want to have a nightmare yeah uh, from a legal perspective how do you sort of make that distinction between something that ju is just a symbol and uh, an expression of free speech free speech uh, to be honest and something that is a sign of hatred uh, or, or, you know, uh, a threat of violence. Yeah, well, in America, uh, of course, we have the, uh, the right to express even uh, very um, uh, disgusting thoughts, uh -huh. uh, thoughts that are offensive and, and hurtful to other people. But um, it can certainly be used as evidence of a motive. If someone kills someone and they are using the Confederate flag just as if they are using the Al-Qaeda symbols, right. um, that certainly can be intent and evidence of, uh, of another motive. Certainly a flag is used uh, as a symbol to intimidate. Yes. And so if there is a goal under the domestic terrorism statute, one of the requirements is an intent to uh, intimidate or coerce a civilian population. And so certainly use or display of a Confederate flag can could be, be evidence of that, of that intent. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we keep talking about uh, nationally the, the need to have a national conversation on race, to talk about inequality and uh, sort of come to terms with these things. But I, I have to admit, I, a lot of times, I'm not sure what that means. I mean, I think there is a lot of conversation about race, and it's something I, I we think, do talk you know what, about. I but think, what is it that yeah. we're not getting to? I, that, I think uh, this needs to be a conversation about who's America. You know, Langston, like, you know, America, America, land of the free, sure. home of the brave, America, be America, because never, America's never been America to me. Right. I mean, I, I, I don't get caught up on color. I mean, I, I know racism exists. The question is, fundamentally, who do we believe this country belongs to? And there's certain people who want to make that based on race or privilege or class. But the reality is that we live in a country where people fled uh, the lack of freedom yes. uh, and the lack of, you know, uh, uh, poor people being able to have ownership. So that's the conversation we're going to have. Not whether, you know, there are fewer white men in power right. or more women displacing men. The question is, are we big enough to embrace everybody and to allow everyone to be included in this, this race for the American dream. Yeah. Well, do you think, though, Horace, that that's what you're saying, though, when we face the realities of inequities, people have to address those issues. We cannot just ignore. No, I'm not saying we don't address them. I'm simply saying is we, we start with what impinges upon the American dream without coming to some consensus right. that it, this is everyone's country. Yeah. And that we all belong here. <laughs> well, it, it's interesting you comment on that because we then have to take a historical context and, and, and race has played a dominant role. Always. In this always. And so has class. Yes. I mean, yeah. you have peons and other folks who came here, indentured servants. I mean, the reality is we held out, you know, bring me your tired huddle masses, yearning to be free. This is a country of unparalleled of opportunity. opportunity. And so as opportunity is narrow because the economy has shrunk, mm -hmm. then we want to constrict yeah. who we give access to. We've got to hold to the net to the ocean. This country belongs to everybody. Right. Uh, the Michigan Civil Rights uh, Commission uh, is dealing with this from from uh, you know a social justice uh, standpoint, but also from again a legal perspective and trying to, to to make sure that the law is applied in the in the right way. Well, you know the the Civil Rights Commission for Michigan is is built one. It was created under the Michigan Constitution. Mm -hmm. And a lot of teeth is found in the Elliott, uh, Elliott Larson, Larson Civil Act. Rights Act. So that's where we base our powers, our, our focus on. Um, but there's still so much more. We, we understand that we've got to also play a role in creating dialogues between law enforcement and the community sure. throughout the state. And I know that we're playing a, a, a leading role there in, in uh, sponsoring these uh, gatherings, these conferences, outpacks, these uh, 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 combination of organizations of community-based and police officers are coming in so we can avoid those instances that we've seen elsewhere yeah. around the United States. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the ironies here. I mean, you have these tremendous strains between the African-American community and law enforcement uh, in, in a lot of places. Here, 
uh, when, when something like this happens, I think African Americans are reminded of the important role that law enforcement has to play in, in dealing with uh, hatred and its connection to, to our awful racial history. Yeah, but um, community and police trust is always essential because the police just can't be effective unless they have the trust of the community that they serve. So that's why we that's work right. at it right. with the Michigan Department of Civil Rights on Absolutely. things like all packed and having that dialogue with citizen groups. We want to know when uh, police are acting improperly so that we can take corrective action because we have to have that trust. Um, sometimes we have to arrest people. Sometimes bad things happen. But if we want citizens to report when they're victims or witnesses to crime or have a tip, right. they need to trust police first. And to have that faith in the uh, But in, that's in also a challenge still because uh, you're not only looking at African Americans, you're Arab communities, the Lots of communities, Latino communities, sure. building that trust takes, it takes but time. But you know, the real discrepancy we'll was in how they here. were apprehended, the guy was apprehended, uh, right. versus, yeah, we I see mean, it that's been little, pointed out too, yeah. I mean, right. it was mild manner. We could, uh, we could talk about this for hours. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. That's our program for today. Thanks for watching. You can get more information about our guests at AmericanBlackJournal.org. And as always, you can connect with us on Facebook and on Twitter. Plus, you can all now hear our program on WDET 1019 FM. We'll see you next time on American Black Journal. At DTE Energy, we believe that we have a greater responsibility. We believe that being part of a community means being involved in the fabric of that community, investing time, effort, and resources in the communities we serve. DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of American Black Journal.